was there. And so for me, when it ended with the first gunshot in Ulster, which essentially crippled our industry, I learned a lot. And I carried that with me, that it ends. This can end. And I carried that with me here to, the, to America, where we saw on January 6th mm -hmm. this year, this can end yeah. if we're not careful, if we don't treat it very, very carefully. That was Turlow McConnell, purveyor of Irish culture in America. And I'm John Lee. And I'm Mark Nutty, and you're listening to Irish Stew. This episode of Irish Stew was brought to you by Murph Guide, the New York City nightlife website. Connecting the fun to the fun people. Visit murphguide.com. Hi there, this is Martin Nutty, and welcome to the Irish Stew podcast. I'm joined by my partner in crime, a man with a mellifluous voice, John Lee. John, say hello and tell us, who do we have on? Wow, Martin, I hope I'm in good voice today after that intro. Well, we've got somebody on who I met maybe a dozen years or so when I was, you know, I've mentioned it before, kind of like reinventing myself and and stepping down New York's Irish trail. And uh, it would take me to the consulate and different kind of events and meetings. I kept running into a very interesting guy named Turlow McConnell. And every time I talked to him, he was doing something else that was even more interesting than the last time. And I was kind of like, God, I, I love what this guy's doing. I'd like to know more about him. And uh, we're going to know more about him today. So welcome from uh, from Donegal and now from New York, Turlow McConnell. Thank you. Thank you both, John and Martin. It's great to be on your show. And um, I'm a fan. I've been listening to the podcast. I listened to the first one with the Minister for the Diaspora, and that was very interesting. And of course, I listened to the most recent one on on uh, Ted Smith, which was wonderful. And that was really a, a, that was a fascinating because here I knew Ted, and I've known him for so many years, casually. But you guys are like you guys are the kings of interrogation. You got <laughs> into Ted Smith in ways that were wonderful. Because it, we really ended up with a full profile of the guy. And the greatest compliment I can give you on that is that I, I just came across this quote earlier today by the film critic Roger Ebert, who said that the reason we love movies is because we can transfer ourselves directly into the story. And with Ted, I ended up, I wanted to be Protestant. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a diplomat. I wanted to work for Heinz. I wanted his life because it was so good. So that was great. And it made me a little nervous about me coming on because I'm not so sure I want my life. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll step gently. <laughs> you know, John and I are truly suckers for compliments. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll take that on board and we'll probably play it 20 times out in our social media. <laughs> but um, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. And... Uh, John, you want to go first? You want me? Yeah, to you know, I, I thought we'd sort of like set the stage a little bit because I gave you such an, you know, I talked about how everything you, you were always involved in something new and interesting. So, um, you know, looking at your, your business, Turlo McConnell Communications, there's a tagline on the website, Ireland in America, which I love. And what does that mean to you? And, and, and what does that sort of indicate about what you're up to? Well, the line, that line came later. But, um, you know, my whole sort of training in America was in the world of corporate communications. And I was the kind of guy who has been working for, you know, Fortune major companies. And I'd be working with them on a day, on my daily shift. But I would also be working on Irish stuff on the side. And it could be, Tourism Ireland, it could have been the government of Ireland, Northern Ireland, it was always my interest was always over there. And um, so I wasn't really, I didn't really go in fully to the Irish communications in America business until maybe I was in here for about 20 years. And I made the shift from dealing with corporate clients and all the fascinating world that that is, and just focusing on Ireland. 
And so for me, uh, I remember telling my son, who's now a, a man in his 40s, I remember saying to my son many years ago, I said, I don't want to touch a, proje- a project that's not Irish, that's not Irish-American, because there was a shift to from things Irish to things Irish-American. And I said, I didn't want to touch a project that didn't have the capacity to be a, an exhibition, a, a documentary, or uh, a book um, about that subject, and it had to be Irish. And I'm really, for what it's worth, I'm delighted to say that uh, the span of my career, particularly in the last 30 years, has been focused in on the Irish-American experience. And I had the very good fortune back about 30 years ago of meeting up with uh, Neil O'Dowd and Patricia Hardy on Irish America magazine. And uh, they hired me to be their marketing vice president. And that suited me because I understood the business of sales and marketing from my work in corporate life. But but I hear I was dealing with things Irish. So it was like the perfect job. And then working with Neil and Patricia and their involvement on the Northern Ireland peace issue, it was a dream job because that's what I most wanted to do is I wanted my focus to be on Ulster, on Northern Ireland, on peace in Ireland. So, you know, it worked out. It worked out. So that's um, kind of leads nicely into my next question, which is one that I usually ask of all of our guests that are kind enough to come and be subjected to interrogation. <laughs> um, is your origin story? And of course, you're from Buncra, which is in the Inishon Peninsula. So for our listeners that look at a map of Ireland, there's a peninsula that pokes out into the North Atlantic right at the top of Ireland. That's the Inishon Peninsula. And it's part of the county of Donegal which in turn is part of the province of Ulster. Not in Northern Ireland, but in the Republic of Ireland. And then part of Ireland is the greater part. So tell me, with all that geographic information (laughs) now in play, um, how much of that Bunkrana do you carry with you to this day? I would say pretty much all of it. All of it. Um, You know, we wouldn't be a program if we didn't quote Seamus Heaney and get that out of the way. <laughs> Seamus Heaney said that only the Irish can live in two places at one time. I have lived in America this April. is going to be 50 years. And I say that with great hesitation <laughs> for all the obvious reasons. But I have lived here for 50 years. And um, I have only ever carried my experience in Bunkrana as the, as the touchstone for everything that has gone on, you know, in my life. So I, and I, I'm very fortunate. I have, I have siblings, brother and sister in Bunkrana today and their children. I have uh, lots of cousins. I d- we did a, a family gathering about 10 years ago. And I think we had about a hundred cousins show up. It was wonderful. And, um, you know, so it's very much part of my life. And people used to tell me back in the early days when I came to New York, people say, well, how do you find New York? Is it so big? Is it so overwhelming? And I have been quoted back to myself as saying, New York is just a bunch of Bunkranas all mm-hmm. together. So I left, I left, Bunkrana to me is magical and kind of mystical. Because my, my, and as I'm speaking to both of you now on, on my computer here, there are two images above my, on the wall here in my studio. One is of my parents' retail store and the other side of the market square. We occupied the square and the town is of my grandparents' hotel, which go, went back in the family to the 1700s. And that's why we had the, the reunion because we knew it wasn't going to continue. It had to stop sometime. So we had the last big hurrah in that place. So to me, my childhood, I would say easily the first 10, 12 years of my life was absolutely magical in that town because the town was so beautiful and the area is so beautiful in Donegal. 
uh, like uh, for those who are geographically thinking, if Ireland had a crown, it would be in a show. <laughs> it would be in a show. And um, it is just, you know, the town was had its own reputation as being a seaside resort from the Victorian era right into my childhood. And my parents and my grandparents and relatives all were part of that industry or resort. And so forget Southampton. I was living in Southampton and <laughs> Donegal. I was there. And so for me, when it ended with the first gunshot in Ulster, which essentially crippled our industry, I learned a lot. And I carried that with me, that it ends. This can end. And I carried that with me here to, the, to America, where I thought, and we saw, we saw on January 6th mm. this year, this can end yeah. if we're not careful, if we don't treat it very, very carefully. So it has been impossible for me to move away from Bunkrana because I still have not found the match of it. Mm. Well, uh, you know, we, we'd like to talk a little bit more about the proximity to Northern Ireland, the fact that you, you know, you really identify as an, as an Ulster man, but uh, right over the border, uh, the, tr- the troubles came came your way from not very far away. Um, h- how did you, did that have anything to do with you moving to the, the next stage in your career or? It, 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 well, it, no, my career is, I, I have the career of, of a creative person, which means I have no clue where I'm going most of the time. You know, I'm just, <laughs> I just hope to God when I get there that I can pay for myself, and take care of myself on the way. Uh, so that's kind of where the career um, you know, idea goes. Now I've had, I've had a journey of really interesting projects along the way that, that continues to this day and actually might be even the best they've ever been at this day, at this time, in this strange time of, of pandemic, simply because of the outlets that we have available to us through technology. Um, but it did affect me, John, because, you know, here we are, up there, taking care of tourists. They're coming in in bus loads. They're, you know, most of them are well, our tourist region. They were either from Northern Ireland or they were from Britain generally. And many, many young Scottish kids who had a grandparent that was in Donegal. So the grandparents would shift boatloads. And I remember boatloads of Scottish kids coming into Buncrana through the port of Derry. And they would come in for what they called the Scotch fairs. And the fairs would run like two weeks. They would come from different parts of Glasgow. There's the Paisley Fair, the Glasgow Fair, all of that. So they were coming in boatloads of kids. And it was just so much fun, the whole thing. So, And then, of course, there were the Americans. It was the year of of the return Yank. Uh, You know, so we're talking about the Erlingus started carting people back in the in the late 50s. So here we had, we'd have busloads of Irish Americans coming through our town, uh, literally in buses, with usually with one to two or three priests in the front of the bus, and then all of the well-meaning parishioners in the back of the bus. All to, And for me, as a local, it was like, we were like in the Serengeti with these people coming in to have a look at us. <laughs> 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 and they'd, they'd come into our stores. My parents were in the jewelry and the souvenir and fabulous stores, great brands, worldwide, world-known brands. And they'd come in and they would buy dozens of plates of John F. Kennedy and the popes, at least one pope and maybe a saint, St. Patrick probably, all on the plate. And we would sell loads of these things, loads of them. And I remember always being struck by the fact that they were all, all of these things, of course, were at that point were made in Japan, but they didn't, nobody ever liked to mention that. So they would put it in Irish, in Gaelic, <laughs> if the label would say, Anchaspan and Chira Jantar, something wonderful like that. <laughs> and, that. That sounds like a very Irish thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so that went on. Then I guess I was in my te- late teens. And I was at a party. Of course, I was very social 
as a kid, because how can you not be when you're in the middle of a boom, a tourism boom? And, you know, you had dance halls and pubs. And I heard a great expression the other night. I watched an interview with the Dubliners and Barnaby Kenneth says, ah, in our town, we had one church and nine pubs. It's called a novena of pubs. <laughs> <laughs> so we had all of this, you know, at home entertainment going on. And then I guess in my late teens, I was at a party on the night of the march to the Brent, Brentullet Bridge in the north. And a brick came through the, ro- the window. And that to me, that was my, that was my crystal knocked. Yeah. That was the night I knew something was changing. And prior to that, I had no, like, I mean, I wasn't brought up in, um, in the poor part of Belfast or Derry. I was, you know, middle class kid. And, you know, and of course we had, we had, there was a lot of money in the tourism business. So my parents were, you know, were doing very, very well and had been doing, everybody had been doing well since the end of the World War II. Since, uh, you know, that opened up, and particularly Donegal, because we had things that they didn't have over the border in Ulster, like sugar, mm. jelly candies, pearl necklaces. And not, this is not my time. This would be a little bit for me. This was my parents' fortune was founded on that sort of stuff. But anyway, so it all ended. And there was our town really uh, paused, just like... I will not compare it to the COVID situation because it wasn't like this at all. I mean, we can do, we're still having a life here. But there was the fear of violence on top of that. And then there was no money because we had no tourists. And anybody who was caught at that stage was really caught. And it wasn't for a few years into the 70s when Enterprise and Donegal people uh, like the McCarter family in, in Bunkrana, who went out and made a deal with Fruit of the Loom to open a factory up there, that, you know, it began to shift. And uh, thank God today it's a whole beautiful place back to, you know, itself. To, and, you know, I give complete credit to the peace process for that. So to see it end, and then for me personally to go back to Derry, in 98, uh, whatever many years that was later, during the, the visit of, of President Clinton, was just miraculous. That was miraculous to think that we could see war happening and ending in, this, in the same space of time was wonderful. So, of course, that's why we're all very nervous to make sure it doesn't change anyway again back to what it was. It's unusual, I suppose, to to see the beginning of a war and even more unusual to see the start of a peace. Oh. And that's a great thing. But I'm guessing from what you're telling me that there is a chasm in between those two points in time, you know, almost 30 years of troubles in Northern Ireland. And you, as a young man, fell into that chasm economically. And as a result probably left Donegal. Is that a fair... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, well, there was a combination of things. One, I was only ever interested in the arts, you know, since I was a child. I was interested, in, um, you know, in the creative world. And I didn't quite know where my place would be in that world. And uh, it's great to say that all these years later, I still am not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> but. I've been able to manage many parts of it because I've had a very curious nature anyway to explore many parts of it. But I've, at first I wanted to be, I wanted to go to the Abbey Theatre uh, because I wanted to be a playwright. And that was my real childhood dream. And even as a child, I'd put on plays constantly in my hometown. Um, and by the way, a good friend of mine, then I was a couple of years older than him, uh, was Frank McGuinness. And Frank, you know, came there. But he did it right. I did it my own kind of scray way, but Frank did it right. But I would put on plays and do things like that, applied to the Abbey, got in, 
and uh, decided that that would be my my I would I would have that the career through the theatre. Well, I was distracted. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. <laughs> I got very distracted along the way with all the other things that were going on. I had wandered away from the pain and suffering that I was experiencing in my life, both on the economic front, but also emotionally. It was a very difficult time for my family. Uh, my mother died young, and she was the brains of our operation. Mm. So, you know, when you lose the, 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 the chief breadwinner and you're in an economic, you know, problem, that's a horrendous place to be. So anyway, I, so I wanted to get away from it and I wanted to get onto my, what I had dreamed of would be my real life <laughs> and my childhood was, this is all an inconvenience on my way to being who it was I was going to be. Uh, there's an old Lily Tomlin joke which she said when she was young, she knew that when she grew up, she wanted to be famous. She just wished she could have been more specific. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of had the same issue. I couldn't decide how I was going to do this. How do you become a writer? How do you become a playwright? Because, I, of course, I had no interest in school. I was kind of like a, an untamed pony. I had no interest in, in settling down and focusing. I probably... I could probably have been diagnosed then for severe ADD or whatever. ADHD, I think. You know, just yeah. totally off the yes. wall. And um, but it it was it was an interesting thing for me. Thank God it didn't kill me because I was so I was so into everything. But um, I met a great the first of two pivotal people in my life was a young expat American guy. Uh, whose name was David Mead, who was a composer. And I was hanging around in the bars in Dublin, like most people in my, in, in my group. Well, only people in my group were hanging around in bars in Dublin and, um, and singing and doing all that kind of stuff. And David, David brought me into a record studio, and we made a record together. And suddenly I found myself, you know, being part of a, of a group <laughs> as a singer. As a kid, and so we were running all. We were going to London, went to London to make, to make a record, and it was like, but it wasn't what I was aiming for. I didn't plan on becoming a singer. I didn't have such a great voice. My father had a great voice. My brother had a great voice, but I didn't have a great voice. It was passable, but I had I had a lot of nerve, and so I did it. But D David was the first person that was really important because David saw in me an ability to write and to focus and convinced me to start writing plays together. And, uh, and we would eventually do that. We would, we began that process. And then I met a young woman also pretty much in the same bar. We were hanging <laughs> around the Bailey and off Grafton street, uh, or Donna, Donna you know, all of those places that were, were that was our novena <laughs> you know, between a lot of them. And she was also a, an American. And she was, these Americans were escaping an America of the 60s. David's wonderful family, fabulous family, were very, a very prominent American family. And um, they just were so opposed to the Vietnam War that they essentially took up and the parents retired, bought themselves a wonderful old, Protestant mansion down in County Offaly. And a party would begin. And I went to their house to a party one night, and I stayed six months. <laughs> uh, so be careful who you invite to dinner or to a party. David and I were working. He was the son of that family. So we were working on plays and music and all that good stuff. So that was happening. Then I met a young lady. Uh, who was again left America at the height of the Kent state, getting away, wanted nothing to do with it. So these became, I, I kind of fell in with an American bunch in Dublin and they fascinated me. They just fascinated me because there was something about them that I, well, they were American mm -hmm. and, you know, and I liked it. I was attracted to it and I could get the sense of, 
sort of straightforward clarity that they were able to articulate to me. So they were speaking my language, even though I didn't know it was my language. So when I fast forward, I, I, we were in London, we're in Dublin. My, uh, my girlfriend came back to New York. I came with her to, to, for her graduation. And the minute, the minute, I had never any intention of coming to, to America because my sense of America were the guys back in the bus up in Bunkrana, <laughs> you know, or Vietnam or some of the, the outrages of that time. So I had no real attraction, no real interest. But the minute I set foot in New York, I thought, I am home. This is home. I do, and I hadn't even seen Manhattan. I hadn't even seen Manhattan. It was just all about Brooklyn because I was driving through what I didn't know then, but I know today. I was driving through the ghosts of the Brooklyn Navy Yard where all those Irish had lived and created, helped to create the city of Brooklyn. I was driving through that. So I just got that sense of the energy of the city. Fast forward, Dave and I wrote plays. We're back in Dublin with a play in 1974. I got the, the posters behind me, even though we were scuttled <laughs> by the critics. But it, it started to teach me how to write. And I would, so I'm back in New York. I'm looking for a job in advertising or any kind of communications. Because I knew that from David's father, Walter Mead was a great advertising guy. And I was very attracted to the idea of writing for an ad agency. You know, it was Mad Men time. Who, who wouldn't, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was show business. And I, oh, I want to be in there. And I knew, I knew I could do two things because of my childhood experience up in Donegal in our family business. I knew I could sell stuff. I knew I was a good salesman. And I also knew that I was a decent writer. So I went to a headhunter and she said, you know, you don't, you don't have the kind of the normal background <laughs> that we <laughs> deal with. <laughs> but she said, I have a job that just might be right for you. And she said, um, she said, it's with a company called Avon products. And I thought, What's that? I don't know. I don't know anything about this. She said, oh, trust me, it's a major company. So with the, here I find myself down at 9 West 57th Street on the 29th floor overlooking Central Park. And the guy who interviewed me, beautiful man called Kevin McDonald, he had read a bad review of, one, of my play. <laughs> 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 and he said, why do you want to work here? <laughs> I said, because I need a job and I know I can do this, whatever it is. <laughs> and he said, well, we need somebody who can write dialogue and scripts. He said, we'll, get, we'll try you out. Ten years later, <laughs> I could not leave that place. It was so much fun. And it, I worked with the best people in the world, the most creative group. Many of them went on to you have huge careers in Hollywood and all over the place in television, particularly in television. And, um, my, and my, I, had, I had a job that I was really good at. I could sell stuff. I could write about it. And, and so I, I became a writer-producer, you know, because it trans, transferred. When I started, there wasn't a lot of film or video in the works. It was, John, you, you might remember, film strips. Yeah, it was yeah, yeah. strips and things like that. Yeah. So I morphed onto the new technology. And I just, you know, and I took off in that field. And, and I got it, made a good living out of it, did well out of it. Thank God luck was with me, bought a house in Brooklyn. And, you know, just had a really good setup. And as I mentioned earlier, I was able to keep my focus on Ireland. I was able to, because everybody encouraged it. Everybody I worked with, they loved, they loved Ireland. And I, you know, and that was the great wake up for me was how much the Irish were really loved. Uh, let me ask you something, Eternal. You, you mentioned, uh, I, I can't remember his name, but the, the guy you interviewed with Kevin at Avon. McCann. 
Yeah. So there's an Irish name there. Hey, have you found the Irish, like, have you, do you play the Irish card? Have you found it a door opener uh, when you come to New York? I play the Irish card like it's Danny Boy. <laughs> but I learned a very important thing. The Irish card will get you in the door. But you better have an American card right behind you. Because everybody loves the Irish and they want to do business with the Irish. I remember doing a study for the Irish government a few years ago, oh, 20 years ago. And they had asked me to do a study on um, how to get the better business businesses, uh, particularly department stores, to buy Irish goods. And so I worked, I thought, great, another perfect job for me. <laughs> now how do I do this? So I called up a friend of mine who was the number one researcher for the Ford Motor Company. And he said, don't worry, Al, my wife and I will help you. So the three of us got together, put our heads together, and came up with a really terrific plan and realized it and made it work. But the thing I learned there in that working with buyers of department stores in America, every one of them, and they didn't know anything. They didn't know who they were dealing with because, of course, the, you know, the one-way glass was going on and uh, discretion and nobody told said who the client was, all that jazz. But when it came around to Ireland, every one of these major buyers would say, we love Ireland. We love dealing with the Irish. We love that they're so, you know, conscientious about uh, keeping to the, the, the schedule. They said where it falls off, though, was the products. They're, 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 they're just at that point. Now, we're... 40 years later, at that point, the Irish were not savvy on how to create products for this climate. Uh, you know, in fact, I remember one story, a guy was trying to sell sweaters to Bergdorf Goodman. And the buyer in Bergdorf, and she told the story, said, you know, the sweater's great. And he says, you know, people will, will only ever have to buy one of them, <laughs> 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 which is not what any retailer ever wants to hear. <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah. Fashion, anyway. and, and not only that, but, you know, they're so totally unsuited to the climate that America wears in general terms. Fine, you buy the one and you keep that forever and you wear it in St. Patrick's Day. But if you want to have a business, you know, you have to be thinking what they're wearing. So to, to cut short, uh, to cut short two hours later, but to get it to the point where you asked John, is that yes, it gets you in the door, but you have to deliver immediately. And that's, that's everywhere. That's not just in America, that's back in Ireland as well. Because of course my experience now is going back and forth in terms of what people over there need and buy and see and want to do business with. But I tend to stay away from business products. I, you know, I've been able to stay focused on arts and culture because that's really my, my main interest. And that's where I, you know, I find creativity is, is a place that I want to live and I want to work in. So Turlow, um, just bridging off that, uh, it was interesting, you know, when you arrive in the States, it seems the climate in New York, let's say, is friendly towards Irish people. And as you well know, the first like major, major wave of migration to America in the 1840s post-famine and certainly, in, you know, into the middle and latter half of the 19th century. That was far the case. And I also noticed that, you know, from your bio is, is that you, you've chosen to spend some time on that particular period of history. Now, given your experience was so positive, why choose a period where, let's say, relations between Ireland and the, the then native-born Americans was certainly far from cordial? Oh, because I'm always behind those who are passionate and who can fight and who can, you know, make their case. So I've, I've, I've always admired and, and I, to this day, you know, my heart goes out to refugees all over the world who are struggling to get on a better footing. So my interest, because it really was my own experience. The thing that drove me the most was that when I first came to America, I was, enraged that Irish America didn't really understand 
the problems we were having in Northern Ireland. And I remember, here I am doing a big program on St. Patrick's Day. I remember the first time I went into a St. Patrick's Day parade, I went in as a protester, mm. carrying a coffin. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't remember that one in the uh, promotional videos. <laughs> I, I was outraged. I remember, and I was with a, a great friend who has long since departed, far too young, the writer Jack Holland, who worked for the Irish Echo for years and was really su the, the supreme reporter on Northern Ireland during the dark days of no, you know, of when so, the, so little news was coming out. Jack was really in the driver's seat. And Jack and I were walking down Fifth Avenue. He would be working on a story and I would just be looking at everybody and doing the thing. And we were just remarked on the banner. There was the first time we saw the banner of England get out of Ireland. <laughs> and we saw that coming down the street. And Jack and I were both with our daughters who were like a year old at the time. And, uh, and Jack said to me, or I said to him, I don't know which of us said it, but it was a great line. I said, now we need a banner to come after that that says, Ireland, get out of bed. <laughs> I like that. I, was, I just want to ask you, uh, you know, Martin kind of brought you back to the, uh, the famine Irish coming over. And, uh, you know, that seems to be one of the touchstones of your creative endeavors. Is it? And what are the themes you keep returning to? Well, let me just tell you about the fa uh, the famine. The famine is, oh God, there was a quote I read the other day that was, it was Timothy Egan, the writer of the, uh, the New York Times, had written a big book, I think about three years ago, on Thomas Marr, the general in the Civil War. And Tom and Egan had a great quote. I'm going to butcher it, but I'll give you the feeling of it. It was, at all of the feasts, the famine is the skeleton in the closet. And with me, it was very personal because now I grew up, I grew up in a very feast like environment. We're talking hotels, tourists. We had the first cappuccino machine in Donegal. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you know? <laughs> so, you know, there was, there was no there was no real sign of a famine or of a hardship but it just so happened that my grand great grandfather had bought the home and the gardens of a man called Bishop Edward McGinn who was the bishop of Derry and Donegal at the height of the famine in 1847 1845, 46, 47, and there. And so my family owned this property, which to this day is, thank God, uh, belongs to my cousin John and his wife and their children and grandchildren. And it's a magical place. It's this, it was, as I remember, it's a thatched cottage, like an, a long L-shaped cottage, but it was unusual. It had French doors going out into the garden. It had paintings on the wall. And in the garden, which are beautiful gardens, and they're still good gardens because John was the gardener and continues to be, uh, you know, keep them in beautiful shape. In the garden was the famine pot that Bishop McGinn fed the people of the area at the height of the famine in the 1840s. And as kids, we played in it, full of water, jumping in it. You know, all that kind of stuff. And years later, so I was always, I was always kind of aware that we had this connection to Bishop McGinn and Bishop McGinn and the McGinn Cottage and the Famine Pot and all that stuff. Years later, I was doing a, I was doing a job for the, um, who was I doing it for? I was doing it for uh, the Arch, uh, the Cathedral of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Uh, it was about the time they started the restoration of the cathedral. So they asked me to come up with a way to talk about the history of the cathedral. So I put together an exhibition that was uh, that documented the history of the building of the cathedral. And of course, the man who, the visionary behind the cathedral was Archbishop John Hughes. 
he's my hero. He is my absolute hero. I, I regard him as the greatest Irish immigrant ever. And I won't go into his entire, I've written so much about him. I've written a play about him. I've written stories about, you know, I, I, Dagger John is my man. Dagger John. Uh, he's my guy. But so when I was doing the research on the cathedral and, and Hughes, I was up at the archives of the archdiocese and the archivist there, a young woman, Kate Ferry, terrific. She did her Irish uh, studies down at NY Glucksman, NYU Glucksman. So Kate was there and, and I was rummaging around with her amazing help, finding material. And at one point she said to me, Torlo, I have a letter here from a Bishop McGinn in Boncrana to Archbishop Hughes. <laughs> you might have to go to a commercial. <laughs> yeah, I, under, I understand that, that your worlds are coming together right there. And I read that letter and it came from that little house that we played in and we lived in and we love. And he was thanking the people of New York for the money they sent to put meal into that pot. So that day, I knew I was doing the Lord's work. That day, I knew I was in my very unusual career. And, um, and I'm delighted to say that since then, well, since then, Tiger John has not let me go. <laughs> mm. Because I find myself doing all kinds of histories of the Sisters of Charity and all that. And th then last year, uh, we managed through my great friendships with Christine Keneally at Quinnipiac and um, Jason King in Dublin and uh, uh, the, the folks down at Stroke Sound Famine Park in County Roscommon. We have over the years uh, been rolling out what they call a famine roadshow that Jason organizes with the help of the Irish government. And last year we managed, and every year the I Ireland has a national famine commemoration day and they choose a famine commemoration site. It could be London, could be New York, could be whatever, uh, Toronto. Um, and last year we got them to designate Bunkrana as, you know, and Bishop McGinn and the heritage. And to me, it was, well, McGinn was also a, an early visionary of St. Columns College in Derry, uh, St. Eugene's Cathedral in Derry. So his, his, his legacy is superb. And, um, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we had to cancel last mm. year in Bunkrana. And I have written, Christine has a new book coming out and I'm a contributor to the book. And I, I wrote that, you know, it was typhus. It was a fever that killed him again in 1848. And it was a fever that damn well killed our plans for last mm. year commemorating his memory. So we're going to keep trying to make, make it happen. But, you know, it just goes to, there's a great um, Faulkner quote that I use a lot. The past is not dead. It's not even past. And, you know, for me, stories like McGinn, John Hughes, the famine, and we should never forget it because it's our responsibility never to let it happen anywhere else. Meanwhile, it's happening all over the, the globe. Meanwhile, so many people are ostracized today with food shortage and hunger and refugees. It's scandalous that we, that, that, that we're not all, you know, go, going crazy about how to solve this because we Irish, it was solved for us by the kindness of America, by the kindness of the ports that took those refugees, those, you know, two million people in between Liverpool and um, Quebec, Toronto, uh, Montreal, you know, all of these different sites, Australia, that took us in. So why should we ever forget that? Yeah, I've had uh, some interesting conversations with um, some of my more conservative American friends uh, surrounding the issues of immigration. And I like to remind them that people from Ireland, generally speaking, have a very 
sympathetic to this day uh, interest in issues of, uh, let's say, refugees, in issues of famine. And I believe that's almost hard baked into Irish DNA as a result of those kind of cultural memories that has been passed from generation to generation. Uh, I, I'm certainly highly aware of it on my, my front. And so any language that is like extremely exclusionary uh, certainly resonates poorly with me uh, and, and I think many other uh, people of Irish extraction. But th- there is clearly, and this was in our conversation with Ted Smith, a discussion about Okay, the Republican Party now has a lot of folks in there, you know, with Irish names and advocating for a much kind of more regressive approach towards immigration. Um, so uh, it, there's an interesting transition. And, and of course, the battle cry about this is all the time is, don't you know where your people came from? Right, right. Well, Mary, uh, Christine Keneally, I interviewed her yesterday for a program that's coming up. And Christine reminds me that when Mary Robinson uh, was president, she took a trip to one of the famine-torn countries. And she said the Irish responded because they have what she called an informed memory. Mm. In the DNA somewhere there, right, Terla? Right. So to me, that's why these stories are important to keep telling and retelling. You know, when, when, uh, when we opened up, I talked about Every time I ran into you, you you seem to be involved with something even more interesting than the last time I ran into you. And we know that the the famine's a real touchstone, and there's a lot of history in what you've done. What what are some of the highlights of some of the you know put a little detail on on this? Uh, what are some of the you know kind of standout projects uh, for you that you you've had the fortune to work on? Well, I don't know. You know, one of the for a while I was the uh, what was my title. I was the uh, corporate director, or corporate, uh, yeah, corporate director for uh, the South Street Seaport Museum, and I wanted to be there because I I loved the connection of the Irish to the seaport and to maritime history, and I wanted to understand it. And by then, I was so fed up with the corporate scene. I wanted to understand the nonprofit scene because whenever I go in to make a sale to try to get somebody interested in my, you know, cultural work, they would say, oh, we're nonprofit, we deal with the state or the city. And I thought, what is this? I got to understand this. I got to, I got to have a way around this. So I was offered a job because I had been working on some Irish projects and the seaboard asked me if I would come and do this work with them. And I did it. And I was, it was, uh, I was on the job for about two, two years or something like that. And I loved it because it was New York history at its rawest in the place where it happened, which is the Seaport District. And the, that time where they were in, in the middle of building a new museum around it. And one day I got a call in my office. I said, Turtle, come quick, come over to the, the new building. The new building, of course, was from the 1700s. Come over to the new building. We've just taken down a wall and we find all this Irish writing on the wall. So I went tearing over. And there on the wall was the great 1798 slogan, Fa'a or as I prefer to call it, Fuck a bollock, <laughs> <laughs> which means literally translates as clear the way, which I, I wouldn't be surprised if that other word didn't come from clear. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so there was clear the way up on the wall with images of guys playing a fiddle. And I thought, oh, my God. And, of course, what happened was these were originally coffee warehouses and cotton warehouses. You know, and we keep scraping here, guys. We're going to come up with slavery in a minute. But, you know, these were the original warehouses. So uh, they preserved that, I'm delighted to say, but a big glass pane in front of it. And the Irish Echo did a beautiful story on it back in the day. That was a highlight. That wasn't the one I was aiming for, though. (laughs) See how easy it is is to go down the wrong road or another. My life is like YouTube. You better not go near it because suddenly you find yourself going down into different directions than the one you planned to go down. (laughs) But that job was monumental for me 
because I was in the job not too long, maybe two years, loving it, enjoying it. And one of my jobs was to organize a schooner race in Manhattan around the battery and all that, uh, once called the Mayor's Cup, and which was so much fun. And I went over to the uh, then the World Trade Center, and we met our committee up in the dining room of the World Trade to see how we were going to make it all work. And then I went over to Donegal that week, and I was at, planned to come back the next week, and 9-11 happened. And I was in my hometown of Bunkrana at the library, of course, where every, any self-respecting writer would be. I was at the local library, and I got a phone call from my, my sister, sister-in-law. said, come to the house quick. And, you know, then that unfolded. But where that led to for me, and of course, we were devastated. Uh, they, the, the whole lower Manhattan was devastated uh, economically from it. But I did a lot of work with the city in terms, remember they had those viewing stations down there around 9-11? Probably all those people are suing the city now. Mm -hmm. but, but, but if you, so we got, the ticketing was from the museum to keep life down, to get life back down there. But one of the things I did was uh, some of the historians connected to the maritime world uh, did an oral history of the day and came up with a beautiful uh, collection of, of oral histories called um, uh, um, All Available Boats. And um, so I heard this and I thought, I could, I could do something with this. So I went to a client of mine, Mike McGee, who was a major guy at Pfizer back in the day. And I brought Mike down and he saw it and he fell in love with it. And he said, let's do this as a full-blown exhibition. And we traveled it around for about two years around the world of stories and film of people who were on their boats that day. Could have been a small rowboat out in Long Island. Could have been a big you know, ferry boat. And they called out from the Coast Guard, all available boats come to lower Manhattan. And that was the... It was the largest evacuation by sea since Dunkirk. So, so that was a highlight, John. You know, beyond that, being part of the uh, of Neil and Patricia and the Irish peace process, uh, you know, organizing the party at the White House when they all got together and the, the prods were singing the Catholic songs and the Catholics were singing the Protestant songs. Mm. And then, then the trip to Derry. And Belfast, for me, Derry, being in my hometown, my home city, which I wasn't allowed to call my city because I was on 14 miles over the border. But Derry is always my city. Um, that was a supreme highlight. Um, and, you know, there have been others, but those walk away with everything. Those moments, those were huge, huge moments. And, and then in between there, there's been all kinds of – what I've mainly been doing is – I, I mainly sort of go chasing after uh, uh, Irish writers. I'm doing a, a series of four films coming up uh, in the next uh, in, the, in the spring on the four Nobel laureates, Irish Nobel laureates, literary laureates, um, Yates, Shaw, Heaney, and Beckett, or in the order Yates, Shaw, Beckett, and Heaney, and that's exciting. We've started working with the scholars, getting the research on them. And it's just been amazing. So I, I, like to, I like to study other writers. Joyce would be supreme in my book. I wrote a play about him and his family, for the, uh, uh, mostly about Nora Joyce, because I was afraid to go near James. Um, but uh, she, helped, she helped show me the way in. And uh, I wrote it for... And with Rosalind Lenahan, the Irish actress, who is amazing and is amazing. So, you know, I'm, I'm very attracted to Irish writers. Um, mostly, you know, the ones there, like O'Casey and the, uh, the Irish theatre in general. Uh, and I think, John, you mentioned the other day when we spoke a play that I, a, a presentation I had made a couple of years ago on the theatre in Ulster. And um, that was, that was great because, you know, these histories just, 
the people that are gathering there are amazing on both sides of the, the ocean. Like I did a lot of work uh, two years ago on Eugene O'Neill, and I wrote a I wrote a a, a theater presentation called Eugene O'Neill: An Irish American Boyhood, and it was O'Neill was really the first generation of the famine post famine crowd. His father was a famine immigrant. And so I was fascinated because I had always been searching for writing from famine New York Times. And who knew? The greatest American dramatist, the only one ever to win a Nobel Prize, he is the writer of the famine. He is. And so working on O'Neill and presenting that both in Ireland and here in New York was an absolute delight to get to know that work and to get to understand the period that there was famine, that famine population lived in. And again, it's informed with so many world figures that had some resonance with the story. So, you know, guys, it's like you're, what you're doing. Once you get these stories going, there's no end mm-hmm. to what's in there. And maybe that's why we're, maybe it's because we're Irish that our love for story is so important. And, and then we, when we, when you, when we find it, we just are relentless about pursuing it. Well, uh, we've had this experience with some, uh, conversations lately where we say, uh, so we'll have to do, we'll have to come back for part two. So that's, that's always, that's always a good sign to Martin and I that we, we feel that way at the end. But, you know, before we get to the end, we'd like to do what used to be called the shameless plug. But in, in conversation with you before we get on the air, we rebranded it as the Seamus plug. So uh, it's a chance for you to kind of tell us what's coming up and how people can tap into it. And then there's a better chance for my name to be always associated with that brand of shameless, shameless plug. <laughs> Are you acquiring kind of copyright on this? Man? Oh, wait a minute now. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We invented it. It's nothing to do with you, Turlo. No, no. We've got lawyers. Started- you said it, and I noticed it. <laughs> All right, shameless plug. Um, St. Patrick's Day. I have had the good fortune to work with George Heslin at the New York Irish Center. George is great, and George brings all the best people together to make magic, which is called theater. And um, George has helped me with maybe some, maybe half a dozen productions. Our big hit was how the nuns of New York tamed the gangs of New York, <laughs> which we had at the, at the, uh, uh, Sheen Center. And it was great. So at Christmas, we decided to create a show, a program around, um, all, for all the people who couldn't go home to Ireland for Christmas. So we did a really great Christmas show with lots of writers and musicians and what have you. So coming into St. Patrick's Day, I thought, We've got to do something for St. Patrick's Day. We've got to make something meaningful. And 10 years ago, another job that I'm very proud of, but I won't get it. Another job I was very proud of 10 years ago was that I was very much an advisor on the creation of the, uh, the, the Great Hunger Museum at Quinnipiac University and working with John Leahy and Christine Keneally, particularly, and Lynn Bushnell. Lynn, under John's guidance and patronage, uh, created the book, uh, with the historian John Ridge on the 250th anniversary of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. So I thought, well, let's do this year's 260 years. So let's do a 260 year celebration online. So this St. Patrick's Day presented by the New York Irish Center, we're presenting what I call history loves a parade. And what it is, it's a salute to the 260 years of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And it's made up of nine milestones during those 260 years. And we've, you know, with images and music, but essentially with real historian experts on each of the segments. So, uh, you know, the Irish in colonial America, 
That was uh, Pat, uh, Pat, Patty Fitzgerald from the Ulster Migration, an authority on the Scots Irish, the famine Irish. I'm going to give you all eight. The <laughs> famine Irish, Christine Keneally, no one more brilliant than Christine on the Irish famine. In the 1860s, the American Civil War, we got the brilliant Harold Holzer, who is the authority on Abraham Lincoln and wonderful. Um, 1880s into early 1900, what was the status of women and migration and immigration? No better authority than Dr. Maureen Murphy, uh, formerly of Hofstra. Maureen has done amazing work on all those women and all those girls who came in through Ellis Island, Clinton, and all that stuff. Um, five, the golden age of New York politics. Nobody does it better than Terry Galway. Terry has written all about Al Smith, Tammany Hall, that whole period as it informed FDR, Roosevelt. And then Terry had a wonderful quote on his show, on his segment. He said, you know, Toni Morrison, the great African-American writer, said that Bill Clinton was the first African-American president. And Terry says that... Um, just lost my train of thought here for a second, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the first Irish Catholic president mm. <laughs> because of who he brought into the administration. Uh, then from then, the torch passes to the John F. Kennedy, and we know how that goes. But the moderator on that, the expert, is Bob Schmuel. Bob is, is the, the chair of uh, presidential history studies at Notre Dame, Brilliant guy. Could, uh, you got to get him on the show sometime. Unbelievable. He's a correspondent to for one of the Irish newspapers based in Notre Dame, writing about the presidency. His son, incidentally, is a real talent as well. He ran Pete Buttigieg's presidential campaign. Oh. So, so the Schmuels are in the business of presidential politics. And then Bob passes that torch to one of my favorite parts of the show. It's the four horsemen and that quiet lobbyist, John Hume. And what was going on with John Hume in America in the 70s and the 80s as John was laying the foundation? And that's going to be held by Morris Fitzpatrick, who has made a documentary on John Hume's, on John Hume, that will be on all of the PBS channels on St. Patrick's Day. We're talking about 150 million viewers. John Hume is going to get the biggest audience of his life, and no one deserves it more. And then they pass the baton to Bill Clinton and the peace process, and we have a young historian who's terrific. Her name is Bonnie Weir, Bonnie Weir, and she's at Yale University, and she's going to tell us what this process is all about. And and that's that's really our sh and then our show ends with what's what's going on with Irish America today. So I'm very excited about this, and I'm glad you asked me. <laughs> and I hope you'll all come and see our show. You'll get it on the New York Irish Center website on the day. It'll be on their channels. And we just hope that we're able to give people a taste of the milestones that the Irish had on their journey in America. So it's on the New York... Uh, New York Irish Center. New York Irish Center. So we go looking for there, and the official title is "History Loves a Parade." Beautiful, okay, folks. What time you, is it, uh, Turlo? When when does this? It'll start first show and it'll be four p.m. Hmm. Eastern Standard, nine p.m. in Ireland. So, folks, you heard it here. History loves a parade. Uh, fire up your Google machine and make sure you log in on St. Patrick's Day. And on behalf of Irish Stew, I would like to thank Turlo McConnell for a wonderful set of recollections. And I think I can speak for John and say we look forward to having them on again because I don't think we scraped, uh, we haven't come close to scraping the bottom of the barrel. And I'm sure there's some pretty nasty stuff down there that we want to get. To. That's where the good stuff is. <laughs> <laughs> next time next time we get you under the uh, interrogation lights <laughs> thank uh, you Carlo. it's such a pleasure and such an honor 
Good luck, guys. Thank you, Taylor. Hey, John, I really enjoyed that conversation with Turlow. I'm curious as to what your take was. Yeah, Turlow, I always felt he was a very interesting guy, and it was fascinating to learn more about him and about his work and about his life. You know, his life took a turn when the trouble spilled over from nearby Derry to his beautiful, idyllic resort town of Bunkrana, and and something was shattered there for him. That was clearly a a dark moment in Turlow's life. But what shines through to me about Turlow is his essential optimism. He's a guy that's been presented with a number of different opportunities, and he's basically grasped the nettle at each and every point because he projects optimism. He acts in an optimistic way. And as a creative, it's probably the most important skill somebody that chooses to live their life in that particular world. And so he's just genuinely good energy. You know, he's just not by himself all the time working artistically. He's collaborating with people and putting on exhibits and things like that. And uh, I think that optimism's got to, you know, just spread when he assembles a team to work on a project. The other thing that you were alluding to is commitment. He is committed to living his life in the creative space. And he is also finding his way as he goes, which has come up with a few of our guests on Irish Stew, stepping forward with commitment, not knowing where you're going, but using that commitment as the core to lead you on to the next step. Hey folks, thanks for listening. If you like what we're doing, please leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts and aren't sure of how to post a review, we explain it all in our blog at irishstewpodcast.com. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums, Cahill O'Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com. <laughs>